Hi, I'm Dave Gardy for Cybersecurity TV from our studios here near Washington, D.C. for another in the Compliance Automation Series with Steel Cloud. And joining us right now here in the studio is Brian Hajos, who's the COO of Steel Cloud. Brian, thanks for joining us. Good afternoon. And via Zoom, we have Tony Sager, who's the Senior Vice President over at the Center for Internet Security. Tony, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Brian. Great to be here. Now, we usually discuss the STIG compliance issues and things like that, but why do you believe it's important to add the Center for Internet Security into, as a CIS benchmark to the discussion? Well, we've talked about STIGs, and STIGs are very much of a standard uh, in the federal government, but outside of the federal government for state and local and for commercial operations, at least in North America, CIS and the CIS benchmarks really are the standard. So we wanted to bring that into the discussion, and, and we're lucky to have uh, Tony join us today. Tony, can you give us some perspective on your background and what you're doing now at CIS? Uh, sure, happy to. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, I've uh, been in the business that we call cyber cybersecurity now for about 45 years and counting. Uh, first 35 were at the National Security Agency working in security testing for defense, and then uh, since then working in the nonprofit Center for Internet Security. So I uh, was responsible for some of the programs that we do at, at the CIS and best practices, and uh, I'm closer to the end of my career than the beginning, so I spend more time now on company strategy and how do we uh, what directions we're going to take in the future. Can you tell us a little bit more about the mission of the Center for Internet Security and why you developed the CIS benchmarks? Sure. Yeah, the company was actually founded uh, in year 2000, uh, specifically uh, around the idea of security benchmarks. So benchmarks is the term that we use at CIS, but others use the term, uh, this is STIG, uh, your audience I'm sure is familiar with. Uh, back when I was at NSA, we called them the NSA Security Guides. At NIST, they were known as security checklists. But they're all essentially spiritual cousins. That is, for a given piece of information technology in my environment, say a Windows desktop or a mail server or a web server, what's the best way to configure and manage that piece of information technology for best security effect, recognizing that it has to do something useful to support the mission and operations? So the company was founded around that time, very late 90s, around 2000. You saw the first NSA security guides, the early DISA STIGs. The Center for Net Security was set up to provide essentially a nonprofit, volunteer-driven equivalent to that. And so what we do is really about uh, organizing a community of volunteers to create these benchmarks and support them over time. And then because it's uh, really created by volunteers, we give all that content away back to the community at no charge and we support the nonprofit through a uh, membership type model. So that was the first 10 years of the Center for Internet Security. In 2010, we added the operation of the multi-state information sharing and analysis centers, the ISAC, uh, to our portfolio, and more recently, the election infrastructure ISAC. So sponsored by Homeland Security, we're also the operational watch center for, I think something in the order of 14,000 state, local, tribal, territorial governments across the country. Excellent. Uh, Brian, we previously discussed how in the past secure configurations using industry standard system level controls such as STIGs or CIS controls, they're the kind of the foundation for all cyber. Um, what areas are affected by these controls? Well, I think you'll see almost all of the current um, um, cyber uh, events in the news. So. Um, Malware, ransomware, uh, zero trust are really all affected and all supported by secure configurations. But I think it'd probably be best to let Tony explain, since he's on the ground um, helping develop the individual controls, how they can combat some of um, the cyber uh, issues that we're dealing with today. Tony, can you give us some perspective of that? Uh, sure, happy to share that. I mean, uh, so, so my perspective goes back again to the very late 90s. And uh, I'd love to tell you that we started the NSA security guides with this grand vision of what would be coming down the road, but it wouldn't actually be true. We actually uh, put them together as almost a, a training or a, a way to compile our best security advice into one place. And uh, it, it was an outgrowth of what we called blue team testing back at NSA, that is friendly, show up on site, talk to the system administrators, scan, and try to uh, repair uh, problems that we saw them there. And uh, so the NSA Security Guides was really put together as a, originally as a training vehicle. And they, they took on a life of their own, kind of consistent with the DISA STIGs. 
And I remember calling, I, I kind of inherited the management job over them. And I remember calling the chief of the blue team and then said, uh, can we tell someone if they follow our configuration guidance, what specific security value they get? That is, what attacks do they stop and so forth? And he looked at me like, we never thought about that. I said, well, we should think about that because this is more than about just do good things because they're good, right? Let's do them because there's a specific security value to them. So he spent an afternoon, did kind of a back of the envelope analysis. And the numbers that we came up with have been repeated many times in many forms. But the bottom line was if you followed the configuration guidance that we were putting out NSA at the time, you dealt with a solid 80% plus of the flaws that we knew about, the attacks that we knew about, and the kind of attacks that we would carry out you know, as a, as a pretend adversary for DOD systems. The number was easily in the mid 80s without even trying. And that was, a, you know, that was a bit of a revelation to me to think about that in those terms. That is, uh, managing a system well gives you tremendous security value. And that theme has continued on for the last couple of decades for me uh, with some refinement as we thought about how to, because it's more than just, you know, here's a set of good things to do, right? Here's the checklist and go check them. It's also about can you manage to them? And that's the world where Brian and his work comes in, which is, you know, I, I need to have a good starting point for managing security defense, but I also really need to recognize that things are gonna constantly change. I'll learn more new things about bad guys. The vendor will come out with new patches and hot fixes. The way businesses will use the technology will change and adapt over time. And so it's not good enough to have uh, a configuration checklist unless you can put in place the management resources to sort of dynamically refresh your understanding, manage to it, look for variation from it, look for the inevitable decay when, you know, as operations go on and on. But it is stood the test of time and we've done uh, even deeper uh, more rigorous analysis of this at the center for internet security to convince ourselves that the bedrock principle this is the way i've always thought about it a good security management is around configuration management because you get the security value but to use it well you also have to have good it management right? you have to have good visibility into your assets recognize change be able to uh, update the, uh, the configuration and the operations of your IT uh, is an ongoing matter. So for us, it's it's a core principle that has uh, been found in the heart of every security framework that I've ever looked at. Interesting. Brian, how is Steel Cloud involved with CIS and their benchmarks? Well, we are uh, a, a cyber control um, automation company, as, as Tony mentioned. Um, we started as a very much of a Stig centric company with a Stig centric product, and as we uh, became more aware of demand for uh, implementing the CIS benchmarks, we uh, enhanced our product. So today, it's agnostic between whether it's CIS or Stig. So we provide all of our commercial customers and state and local government uh, customers the same level of automation, the same level of control that we do the federal government on the sticks. And so, um, again, we're real excited about the, the the opportunities that are presenting itself in the uh, um, in the commercial marketplace with CIS. What do you see in regards to industry standard adoption in the non-federal space? Well, as I mentioned, it, it, you know, STIGs are very uh, federally centric, and CIS are, are the, um, the 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 other standard, and the standard that's most adopted by the non-federal agencies. So, the, the real change is not that they're adopting CIS controls, but the the commercial organizations are looking for industry standards, and in North America, there are only two. And so as uh, the commercial marketplace matures and more and more uh, CISOs understand the points that Tony made about these controls being the foundation for cyber, we're seeing you know, large organizations and even medium-sized organizations moving from their proprietary you know, hodgepodge of different controls to uh, an industry standard. And, and uh, Steel Cloud is here to support them with automation tools that allow them to do that effectively uh, and at a, at a cost that's reasonable for their organizations. Tony, could you give us a view of the CIS of the future from a CIS vantage point? 
Yeah, I think um, one point I make in reflecting what Brian just said, I, I tell everybody that I talk to in this industry, you have a security configuration for your IT, whether you know it or not. Right? Even if it's the fault that came out of the box from the vendor, that's more like an insecurity configuration though than a security configuration. But this idea of, um, you know, IT is complex. We ask it to solve lots of different problems. And the goal is to get scale in both management of IT, but also in the security of it. And scale normally comes with standards, both the standard plumbing to move things from place to place, but also, you know, why should every enterprise on earth try to figure out their own security configuration when in fact 80 to 90% of it's going to be identical. And so the idea is at a minimum, start from something that you can trust, like the CIS benchmarks, like a business state if you have to, and build upon that, right? Because you get a lot of collective brain power that's built into the creation of those, most of which you can't find or pay for, even if you wanted to hire them. But the idea is to make this much more uh, machine friendly, automatable, and to do this at scale. So, you know, scale is not human beings running around like we used to do in the old days, right, with DVDs and, you know, poking in uh, configuration changes. It's about a high level of automation, adherence to standards, uh, managing this at a sort of console or operational uh, level, and then looking for variations. Something has happened. Someone has made a change that wasn't authorized. Some, uh, some process has introduced code that wasn't authorized to run. So it's about managing to exceptions. So I think if I were going to look at this in the future, we'd see much more of this built in. You know, that is, and we've taken, I think, the initial steps on this in CIS. You know, the old model was take our content, download it, and sort of figure out what to do with it. Now you can go right to the cloud providers and get them pre get their uh, images pre-configured to what CIS says. You can go to great vendors like Brian's team and sort of get all that uh, management built in for you. And the idea is less handcrafting, less artisan work, more about this machine, uh, really large scaling of security defenses, and then being able to manage to exception. So we'll see more and more of this, I think, built into in, what we'll call infrastructure. I think people are catching on at a security policy and framework level that's actually good IT management to standardize a lot of this routine uh, configuration things and not count on every individual sysadmin to do it on their own. So much more scaling, much more automation, and much more policy support. That is, you really need to do something like this and preferably tie it back to some trusted source like a disestig, like an NSA security guide, like a CIS benchmark. Okay, um, Tony, if our viewers want to find out more about the Center for Internet Security and CIS benchmarks, where should they go? Well, start at the cisecurity.org. So we're a small but mighty nonprofit. Everything that we do is uh, available to the public and we're happy to both uh, make it available to you directly and or reach out to us through the contact information there. Excellent, and Brian, if people want to find out more about Steel Club? Uh, www.steelcloud.com. www.steelcloud.com. We've been talking with Brian Hages, who's the COO of Steel Cloud, and also Tony Sager, who's the Senior Vice President at the Center for Internet Security. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. I'm Dave Gardy for the Steel Cloud Compliance Automation Series on Cybersecurity TV. Thanks for watching. Thank you. Thank you.